The iron pillar located in Delhi, India, is a 7 meters column in the QUTB complex, notable for the rust-resistant composition of the metals used in its construction. The pillar has attracted the attention of archaeologists and materials scientists and has been called a testament to the skill of ancient Indian blacksmiths because of its high resistance to corrosion. The corrosion resistance results from an even layer of crystalline iron hydrogen phosphate hydrate forming on the high phosphorus content iron, which serves to protect it from the effects of the local Delhi climate. The pillar weighs over 6,000 kilograms, and is thought to have originally been erected in what is now Sudayagwiri by one of the Gupta monarchs in approximately 402 CE, though the precise date and location are a matter of dispute. It was transported to its current location in 1233 CE. Description The height of the pillar, from the top of its capital to the bottom of its base, is 7.21 meters, 1.12 meters of which is below ground. Its bell pattern capital is 1.07 meters in height, and its bulb-shaped base is 0.71 meters high. The base rests on a grid of iron bars soldered with lead into the upper layer of the dress stone pavement. The pillar's lower diameter is 420 mm, and its upper diameter 306 mm. It is estimated to weigh more than 6 tons. A fence was erected around the pillar in 1997 in response to damage caused by visitors. There is a popular tradition that it was considered good luck if one could stand with one's back to the pillar and make one's hands meet behind it. The practice led to significant wear and visible discoloration on the lower portion of the pillar. Original location The first location of the pillar has been debated. While the pillar was certainly used as a trophy in building the Qawwad al-Islam Mosque and the Qutb complex, its original location, whether on the site itself or from elsewhere, has been discussed frequently. A summary of views on this subject and related matters was collected in volume edited by M. C. Joshi and published in 1989. More recently, opinions have been summarized again by Arpinda Singh in her book Delhi, Ancient History. R. Alice Ubramaniam explored the metallurgy of the pillar and the iconography based on analysis of archetype Gupta gold coins. In his view, the pillar, with the wheel of discus at the top, was originally located at the Udayagwiri Caves, situated near Vidisha in Madhya Pradesh. This conclusion was partly based on the fact that the inscription mentions Visnapadajiri. This conclusion was endorsed and elaborated by Michael Willis in his Archaeology of Hindu Ritual, published in 2009. The key point in favor of placing the iron pillar at Udayagwiri is that this site was closely associated with Chandragupta and the worship of Vishnu in the Gupta period. In addition, there are well-established traditions of mining and working iron in central India, documented particularly by the iron pillar at Dar and local place names like Lohapura and Loangi Piyar. The king of Delhi, Hiltutmish, is known to have attacked and sacked Vidisha in the 13th century and this would have given him an opportunity to remove the pillar as a trophy to Delhi, just as the Tuflug rulers brought Isokan pillars to Delhi in the 1300s. Inscriptions The pillar carries a number of inscriptions and graffiti of different dates which have not been studied systematically despite the pillar's prominent location and easy access. The oldest inscription on the pillar is in Sanskrit, written in Gupta period Brahmi script. This states that the pillar was erected as a standard in honor of Vishnu. It also praises the valor and qualities of a king referred to simply as Chandra, now generally identified with the Gupta king Chandra Gupta II. Some authors attempted to identify Chandra with Chandra Gupta Maurya and yet others have claimed the pillar dates as early as 912 BCE. These views are no longer accepted. 
The dating of the inscription is supported by the nature of the script and the Sanskrit poetics, both of which reflect the conventions of Gupta times. Thanks to the tablets installed on the building in 1903 by Pandit Bankre, the reading provided by him enjoys wide currency. His interpretation has, however, been overtaken by more recent scholarship. The 1903 tablets read as follows, He on whose arm fame was inscribed by the sword, when in battle in the Vanga countries, he needed back with breast the enemies who, uniting together, came against, he by whom, having crossed in warfare the seven mouths of the Sindhus, the Valigas were conquered, he, by the breezes of whose prowess the southern ocean is even still perfumed, he, the remnant of the great zeal of whose energy, which utterly destroyed enemies, like of a burned out fire in a great forest, even now leaves not the earth, though he, the king, as if wearied, has quit this earth, and has gone to the other world, moving in from to the land won by actions, remaining on earth by fame, by him, the king, who retained sole supreme sovereignty in the world, acquired by his own arm and for a very long time, who, having the name of Chandra, carried a beauty of countenance like the full moon, having in faith fixed his mind upon Vishnu as this lofty standard of the divine Vishnu was set up on the hill Vishnu Pada. The inscription has been revisited by Michael Willis in his book Archaeology of Hindu Ritual, his special concern being the nature of the king's spiritual identity after death. His reading and translation is as follows, Nasyeva Visjagam Narapeta Gjam Shri Tas Yatra Mertu Karma Hita Vanam Gata Veta Kirtyus Tatas Ukazatau, Santasyeva Mathavain Huta Bujo Yas Uprata Poman Najapiats Jati Pranasitari Pur Yat Nas Ukazatam, the residue of the king's effort, a burning splendor which utterly destroyed his enemies, leaves not the earth even now, just like a burned out conflagration in a great forest, he, as if wearied, has abandoned this world, and resorted in actual form to the other world, a place won by the merit of his deeds, he has departed, he remains on earth through fame, he concludes, Kandra Gupta may have passed away but the legacy of his achievement is so great that he seems to remain on earth by virtue of his fame, emphasis is placed on Chandra Gupta's conquest of enemies and the merit of his deeds, ideas which are also found in coin legends. Kesatamavahitya Sakaratar Divam Jayati Vikramaditya I. E. Having conquered the earth with good conduct, Vikrama did you conquered heaven. The king's conquest of heaven combined with the description of him resorting to the other world in bodily form, confirms our understanding of the worthy dead as autonomous theomorphic entities. One of the later inscriptions, dated to 1052 CE, mentions Tamara King and Nangpal II. This has suggested by some, without any substantial basis that the pillar was installed in its current location by Vigraha Raja, the ruling Toma king. Scientific analysis. The pillar was manufactured by the forge welding of pieces of wrought iron. In a report published in the journal Current Science, R. Balas Ubramanium of the IIT Kanpur explains how the pillar's resistance to corrosion is due to a passive protective film at the iron rust interface. The presence of second phase particles in the microstructure of the iron, that of higher amounts of phosphorus in the metal, and the alternate wetting and dry existing under atmospheric conditions of the three main factors in the three-stage formation of that protective passive film. Lepidocrosite and gothite are the first amorphous iron oxyhydroxides that appear upon oxidation of iron. High corrosion rates are initially observed. Then, an essential chemical reaction intervenes. Slag and unreduced iron oxides in the iron microstructure alter the polarization characteristics and enrich the metal scale interface with phosphorus, thus indirectly promoting passivation of the iron. 
The second phase particles act as a cathode, and the metal itself serves as anode, for a mini-galvanic corrosion reaction during environment exposure. Part of the initial iron oxyhydroxides is also transformed into magnetite, which somewhat slows down the process of corrosion. The ongoing reduction of lepidocrosite and the diffusion of oxygen and complementary corrosion through the cracks and pores in the rust still, contribute to the corrosion mechanism from atmospheric conditions. The next main agent to intervene in protection from oxidation is phosphorus, enhanced at the metal scale interface by the same chemical interaction previously described between the slags and the metal. The ancient Indian smiths did not add lime to the furnaces. The use of limestone as in modern blast furnaces yields pig iron that is later converted into steel. In the process, most phosphorus is carried away by the slag. The absence of lime in the slag and the use of specific quantities of wood with high phosphorus content during the smelting induces a higher phosphorus content than in modern iron produced in blast furnaces. One analysis gives 0.10% in the slags for 0.18% in the iron itself. This high phosphorus content and particular repartition are essential catalysts in the formation of a passive protective film of misawite, an amorphous iron oxyhydroxide that forms a barrier by adhering next to the interface between metal and rust. Misawite, the initial corrosion resistance agent, was thus named because of the pioneering studies of Misawa and co-workers on the effects of phosphorus and copper and those of alternating atmospheric conditions in rust formation. The most critical corrosion resistance agent is iron hydrogen phosphate hydrate under its crystalline form and building up is a thin layer next to the interface between metal and rust. Rust initially contains iron oxide oxyhydroxides in their amorphous forms. Due to the initial corrosion of metal, there is more phosphorus at the metal scale interface than in the bulk of the metal. Alternate environmental wetting and drying cycles provide the moisture for phosphoric acid formation. Over time, the amorphous phosphate is precipitated into its crystalline form. The crystalline phosphate eventually forms a continuous layer next to the metal, which results in an excellent corrosion resistance layer. In 1,600 years, the film has grown just 1 20th of a millimeter thick. In 1969, in his first book, Chariots of the Gods, comma, Eric von Daniken cited the absence of corrosion on the Delhi pillar and the unknown nature of its creation as evidence of extraterrestrial visitation. When informed by an interviewer, in 1974, that the column was not in fact rust-free, and that its method of construction was well understood, Van Daniken responded that he no longer considered the pillar or its creation to be a mystery. Ballas Ubramanium states that the pillar is a living testimony to the skill of metallurgists of ancient India. An interview with Ballas Ubramanium and his work can be seen in the 2005 article article by VZ. Further research published in 2009 showed that corrosion has developed evenly over the surface of the pillar. It was claimed in the 1920s that iron manufactured in Merjati near Jamshedpur is similar to the iron of the Delhi pillar. Further work on Adivasi iron by the National Metallurgical Laboratory in the 1960s did not verify this claim. Evidence of cannonball strike. A significant indentation on the middle section of the pillar, approximately 400 centimeters from the current courtyard ground level, has been shown to be the result of a cannonball fired at close range. The impact caused horizontal fissuring of the column in the area diametrically opposite to the indentation site, but the column itself remained intact. While no contemporaneous records, inscriptions, or documents describing the event are known to exist, historians generally agree that Nadir Shah is likely to have ordered the pillar's destruction during his invasion of Delhi in 1739 CE. 
as he would have considered a Hindu temple monument undesirable within an Islamic mosque complex. Alternatively, he may have sought to dislodge the decorative top portion of the pillar in search of hidden precious stones or other items of value. No additional damage attributable to cannon fire has been found on the pillar, suggesting that no further shots were taken. Historians have speculated that ricocheting fragments of the cannonball may have damaged the nearby Quwar al-Islam Mosque, which is known to have suffered damage to its southwestern portion during the same period, and the assault on the pillar might have been abandoned as a result.